Hey guys, what's up? Tyler here. So when it comes to aliens in science fiction, there's often a tendency to depict them as being humanoid in appearance. This is often because of production limitations, but even in some CG franchises like Mass Effect, this trope still exists. But I think science fiction is at its best when it tries to go more outside the box, and one perfect example of this, in my mind, is the 2016 film Arrival. Directed by Denis Villeneuve, Arrival depicts first contact between humans and members of an extraterrestrial civilization who have landed 12 gigantic ships, nicknamed shells, on various locations on Earth. The story primarily follows a linguist named Dr. Louise Banks, played by Amy Adams. She is hired by the U.S. Army alongside astrophysicist Dr. Ian Donnelly, played by Jeremy Renner, to try and communicate with members of the alien race who have landed in Montana. As hinted in the marketing and shown pretty early in the film, the heptapods are so named because of their seven uh, tentacle-like appendages that they use to walk and also express their visual language. The heptapods' physiology and uh, their forms of communication are really, really interesting to me. They're honestly unlike any extraterrestrials featured in major science fiction before this. Their appearance and the way that they conduct themselves is truly alien in the sense that it defies our normal expectations of how life would behave on Earth and it resembles what some scientists believe aliens would actually look like. In this video, I want to explore the heptapods' biology, uh, as well as how their language works, and how plausible both are given what we think we know about the universe. Arrival is based on the 1998 novella Story of Your Life by writer Ted Jeong. There are some significant departures uh, in the film from the source material, but the basic premise and a lot of the details are still preserved from the original story. If you haven't seen the film, I definitely recommend it to anyone who has even a passing interest in sci-fi. It's such a work of art with a powerful story about communication that also has a lot to say about human society. Even though the film came out five years ago, uh, I will go ahead and warn that I'm going to be talking about some spoilers in this video. With that said, let's get started. As I mentioned earlier, the heptapods are so named because of their seven limbs. When walking, they appear to uh, put five limbs forward and pull the other two from behind. On the end of each tentacle-like appendage is a hand of sorts, shaped like a starfish, and out of an orifice on each hand, they can project an ink-like substance that forms a circular pattern that forms the basis of their written language. This language, which I'll talk about in more detail later, is called Heptapod B by Louise, uh, and is distinct from their vocalizations termed Heptapod A. Their skin is a dull bluish gray uh, with a rough looking texture, and the atmosphere of uh, their ship's interior appears to be some sort of thick white misty fluid. Their ships seem to be made of some kind of stone that uh, has no resemblance to any familiar metallic structure on Earth. Not only is the composition of their spaceship unknown, uh, but the shells emit no visible radiation or waste or gas, and uh, they have no visible forms of propulsion, and they hover just a few dozen feet off the ground. Inside a corridor with artificial gravity, Louise, Ian, and the other scientists and military personnel communicate with two of the heptapods from behind a transparent barrier. The glimpses that most of the team gets of the two heptapods, nicknamed Abbott and Costello by Ian, uh, are of their lower body, as they lack visible eyes or mouths. Uh, attempts at a common understanding are reliant entirely on translating their written symbols. The heptapod vocalizations, which were made for the film by mixing pitch-lowered bird calls, uh, instruments like the bagpipe and the didgeridoo, and breathing through folded paper, are akin to whale sounds, uh, which means that the heptapods might communicate with each other uh, through some form of echolocation. But as you might imagine, what the team sees and what the audience sees for most of the runtime is not the full picture. You see, the heptapods, uh, whose true height is estimated at about 9.8 meters, possess a very large, uh, roughly diamond-shaped torso that resembles a squid body with a bulbous head-like protrusion at the top. In a scene towards the end of the film, when Louise is taken into the ship's interior by Costello, uh, she's able to breathe their atmosphere, though not without some difficulty. 
uh, meaning it probably has some level of oxygen in it. Despite their size, the heptapods can swim or fly, uh, if you will, through this medium, uh, and they can land softly on the ground, take off again, etc., uh, much like a sea creature. While the heptapods share some traits with aquatic animals like cuttlefish uh, and even cetaceans, their design still defies our normal conceptions of the way that complex life behaves on our planet. Many astrobiologists, people who study what life might be like on alien worlds, believe that to truly conceptualize uh, and understand life that evolved in a foreign biosphere, we must open our minds to alternative biochemistries and even unconventional body plans. In Story of Your Life, Zhang describes the heptapods as being radially symmetrical, that is, with body parts repeating around a central point, rather than being mirrored on a vertical or horizontal axis. But as we see in the film, this is not really the case. They're still bilaterally symmetrical, uh, but the similarities with humans mostly stop there. The interior of the heptapods ships behind the barrier, uh, presumably mimicking the atmospheric conditions on their homeworld, is particularly interesting uh, from an evolutionary perspective as the air is dense enough that it exhibits properties between a liquid and a gas. The surface gravity on the heptapod's homeworld is most likely lighter than on Earth, uh, but the main takeaway in my view is that the thickness of the atmosphere is conducive to not only the heptapod's size but their graceful locomotion. As many astrobiologists would tell you, this is not at all implausible. We know that water exists under the surface of many bodies in our solar system and is probably common throughout the universe. But many planets that we've cataloged uh, actually are thought to possess an atmosphere or an internal composition that is referred to colloquially as hot ice. The technical term for this hot ice is superionic ice, and it's a black crystalline substance created by the immense temperatures and pressures and gravity of some alien worlds. It's often called an exotic form of matter. It's part solid, part liquid. First predicted by computer simulations in 1988, uh, scientists have even been able to manufacture superionic ice in the lab using x-rays, and it is the 18th crystalline architecture of frozen H2O that has been discovered. Some scientists think that superionic ice may actually be the most common form of water throughout the universe, more common, in fact, than liquid water or regular ice or even water vapor. It may even be what truly composes the cores of gas giants like Uranus and Neptune. Though this isn't exactly the same as the misty white fluid that surrounds the heptapods, it is similar in principle. This cloudy substance acts in a similar way to water anyway. It dissolves oxygen and presumably other gases, and the heptapods' breathing mechanisms are able to, I'm assuming, filter these gases to power their muscles. And the floor that the heptapods walk on when they're not flying around uh, is a glass-like material with a serrated texture. It may be uh, composed of a substance like silica oxide or quartz, not too far off from the sandy ocean floors of our planet. Indeed, all of this points to what is undoubtedly uh, quite a unique geology and topography of the heptapods' homeworld. But besides their appearance and their environment, what about the way that the heptapods express their thoughts and experiences towards humanity? Naturally, Louise is not the only person uh, recruited to establish communication with the heptapods. Remember, this is just one of 12 sites on Earth where they've landed. But while she does receive some assistance from teams in other countries in deciphering their language, Louise really is the one who makes some of the biggest breakthroughs in deciphering their intent. One of the biggest sticking points in the film is when, after weeks of building up a vocabulary of increasingly complex words and phrases, Louise is finally able to ask, effectively, why are you here? And the response, which scares the ever-living daylights out of the world's militaries and much of the broader populace, is offer weapon. As Louise explains, though, automatically interpreting this phrase as a threat is quite narrow-minded. She points out that the heptapods might not even really know the difference between a weapon and a tool, a distinction that is largely dependent on cultural context. Nevertheless, offer weapon is taken negatively by the Chinese military, 
uh, whose declaration of war against the heptapods threatens to uh, cause a breakdown of cooperation between the nations of the world. But Louise, who throughout the film has visions of her dying daughter that increase in frequency as she learns more heptapod B, figures out a way to stop this breakdown from de-escalating further and even figures out a way to reverse it. By the way, just another reminder, some heavier spoilers ahead. You see, not only is heptapod B modular, meaning that it consists of ideograms composed of uh, subsections conveying different ideas, but it can be read forward and backwards, and sentences are written all at once. There is no proper word order, which may strike us as unusual, but is actually a feature of some human languages like Hindi. One of the gimmicks in the film, and I use the word gimmick not so much in a judgmental sense, but more of in a matter-of-fact connotation, uh, is that the more you understand heptapod B, really understand it, uh, it can induce a nonlinear perception of time. In fact, this is how the heptapods perceive the world. Those visions of Luis's daughter growing up and dying of cancer, yeah, those haven't happened yet. The arrival of the heptapods is not the end of her story, but the beginning. This is the weapon that the heptapods are offering humanity, their language. It's not so much a weapon as a gift, for in 3,000 years, according to Costello, the heptapods will need humanity's help. Louise uses this nonlinear perception of time to her advantage. In the future, General Shang of the Chinese People's Liberation Army uh, meets her at a United Nations event, and he tells her about the time that she called him on his personal cell. Now, she doesn't remember this happening. She says, General, I, I don't know your private number. But he shows it to her and says, No, you know. She calls General Shang in the present and repeats his wife's dying words, which she hears for the first time in the future. You see where this is going? And it's this astounding feat that helps de-escalate China and its allies' attacks on the heptapod vessels. The inducing of a nonlinear perception of time uh, by becoming fluent in heptapod B is a somewhat exaggerated implementation of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, the idea that the language that a person learns in life can affect the way that they perceive the world, their cognition, even rewire connections in their brain. One major critique of Arrival, of course, is that its use of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis goes way, way beyond anything that is remotely plausible. This is actually the chief complaint that I have with the film, uh, and my gut reaction on first watch was that the ending was the weakest part, yes, even in a film about aliens landing on Earth. Now, I, I still kind of feel this way, to be honest, but on rewatch, I can, of course, appreciate some of the seeds that they planted uh, to set up this major twist. In the behind the scenes for Arrival, Ted Chong and others discuss how, in terms of physics, special relativity makes no real distinction between past, present, and future. They exist simultaneously, as supported by the equations that govern the laws of nature. In any frame, you could reverse the arrow of time, and these equations would still hold true. This is called time symmetry. One theory is to the reason that we have such a limited perception of time. Uh, why we can only observe it going in one direction and that we uh, don't remember future events is not necessarily because the future is open-ended, uh, but because it represents a state of increased entropy as per the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy wins. Entropy always wins. Our memories and perception of the world are built by uh, the organization of atoms and molecules and the transmission of electrical signals in the brain uh, from a lower entropy state to a higher entropy state. So we remember the past as it's closer to the Big Bang uh, as opposed to remembering future events which are further off in the future towards the heat death of the universe. Basically, besides communication, uh, one of the biggest themes that Arrival explores is determinism. The idea that the future is fixed and we do not have the free will to change the outcome. Under this interpretation of the world, free will is simply an illusion. This is exemplified in Louise's decision to still have her child, Hannah, even though she knows Hannah is going to die because truthfully, we're all going to die one day. And life is about coping with this uncomfortable truth by living the best life we can. As we learn, by the time Hannah's about seven, uh, Louise informs Ian, 
Hannah's father, about Hannah's true fate, and he angrily divorces her, saying that she made the wrong choice. Perhaps, despite being a physicist, he doesn't subscribe to the determinist philosophy. But as Chong points out, just because you know the future doesn't mean you have the power to change it, and this is likely the other uncomfortable truth that Louise had to come to terms with. As for how a species could have evolved such a non-linear perception of time, well, that's still kind of a hard pill to swallow. We're pretty confident that we can understand how certain animals experience time. We think it probably passes more slowly for flies, for example, which is how they can escape a fly swatter so easily. But given that arrival takes place apparently in a universe where determinism is real, I guess it's not so crazy that an alien race could uh, evolve such a nonlinear perception of time by accessing the fourth dimension. Just like the prophets from Star Trek Deep Space Nine and the observers from Fringe, the heptapods would experience all moments on their world line simultaneously, just as we can move through space. It's all about perception. Their brains would process the information associated with forming memories and recalling memories fundamentally differently from ours. Of course, I still think that it's kind of a stretch that any being, human or alien, could uh, do this as it runs contrary to our understanding of the second law of thermodynamics, if that's really what governs our perception of time. But if the future really is fixed, uh, if all that's stopping us from remembering future events is the way that we communicate, then perhaps uh, we can expand our understanding of time as we gain more knowledge about the universe. Even if we can't change the future, we should remind ourselves that the only way to not squander this knowledge as long as we're mortal is to uh, find fulfillment in life by living in the present as best as we can. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I did not think that I was going to be talking this long about the heptapods from Arrival, but maybe I just need to start thinking more non-linearly. As always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out, and I'm obviously interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and be sure to click the bell icon to receive all notifications. Click that bell. If you want to support my work even further, then you can become a member or a patron. Uh, links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description below. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you in the next video.